everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Guide Collective Travel Roundtable. I'm Andrew. We've got a familiar face and a, a few first timers on here. So let's give a warm welcome to first timer Colin all the way from New Zealand. And he's got Mon Mondumo Small Group Tours. Yes, good morning, or as we say in, in New Zealand, Morena for good morning. Um, and we have Anna all the way from Piedmont. So she's in our same time zone, thankfully. And she has Italiana food and wine tours. And you'll find both of them on, Gui on the Guide Collective. Hi, Thank Anna. you for having me. I'm very excited. All right. It's always nice to have some new blood on the show. And then I see a familiar face. Trish, how are you doing? Trish Feaster. Hey, how's it going, Andrew? Hi, Colin. Hi, Anna. Good to see you guys. You Hi, too. Trish. So we've got a bunch of topics. And as you might have noticed, someone updated the event page. So now everyone will know what we're talking about. But in case you didn't have a chance to check out what we're talking about, we're gonna be talking about political instability and travel. We're gonna be also telling stories of how we use our travel smarts to get us out of some tight jams and sticky spots. Eating alone in restaurants, is this a yay or nay? And something new, just because it's been in the news a lot the last few days is, is rapid testing coming into an airport near you. And then we'll do an around the horn at the very end, talking about autumn, since this is our first show of the autumn. So my virtual background is from a place in Baku, Azerbaijan, and that will lead us into our first topic about political instability and travel. I had a tour plan for Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia this year. For obvious reasons, it won't run. But this summer, there was a small uh, flare up between Armenia and Azerbaijan in one of their like disputed provinces, this kind of borderland that's like that no one recognizes. Mm. And it kind of hit me like, oh, it, okay, uh, outside of COVID, like, is this going to be a problem? Now, I know this thing happens every few years. It's not near anything I go to uh, on, on the tour and probably not near most things that people go to. And I was just in both of these countries about a year and a half ago. And even though you could talk with people and get an idea of, you know, animosities, or, you know, you can kind of read in the newspaper what this government says or that government says, do you really notice anything there? Um, I ran a tour in Western Ukraine a few years ago, and I just had a few people say, okay, is there still some separatist thing going on? And the truth is, yeah, it's a thousand kilometers east of here. And when you put it into perspective, they said, okay, yeah, and there's no, there's not, uh, there's no travel warnings for this particular spot. And, you know, people can kind of, you know, use their judgment and say, okay, maybe I don't need to react so, so much just to, to something when you see, you know, something in the news and you don't, you don't have all the information. So um, I've run a few tours in places and for sure when I've done things in Turkey before certain parts of Turkey I'm, were, were probably under like advisement of not going and I'm certainly not the kind of person that only reads the US State Department's travel warnings or not, I will look at them, but they're not like, you know, like uh, biblical tr truth to me. Um, and I'm wondering here, uh, Trish, maybe if you've had some, some uh, uh, examples or sometimes where you've been traveling, whether with a group or, or just kind of by yourself in places where, you know, maybe you, you know it going into it, or maybe when you come back, you realize, oh, there's all this stuff going on. And did you, did you notice it while you were there? Actually, yeah, I've had that happen a number of times in my journeys, either when I'm traveling solo, when I was taking my students to Europe, um, when I've been with my own tour groups, uh, when I did some um, scouting tours with, uh, with Rick Steves in Egypt. And, and all of those times, you know, something either happened just right before I was about to travel or there was ongoing turmoil. In Egypt, for example, um, we went there two years after the Arab Spring tourism was completely down. Um, everybody was on kind of this heightened awareness situation because there was so much chaos and instability with the government. Um, the protests had been going on. And so people were really concerned in my family in particular. Um, you know, They were asking me, is it okay for you to go? Are you gonna be all right? What's gonna happen? And the thing to remember is, is that there are people living in those places and that a lot of the places that you go are much larger than what you think. There might be something happening in the downtown area, but you might be a solid two miles away from that, or you might be on the opposite side of the city. 
um, when things are happening like that, also security does go up. And so there is more vigilance, there is more alertness. And so if you are savvy about not going to those areas that might be particular hotspots, like if I heard a riot was going on, I wouldn't go to that area. I'd pretty much avoid that, but it doesn't mean that I couldn't enjoy other places or be with friends or do something like that. Um, the same things kind of happened um, when I was taking students to Europe and it was maybe three months after the Atocha bombing had happened in Madrid. And so there was a terrorist bombing that happened there in the train station and it was a place that we were going to be. It affected our travel because we couldn't go into that train station. Um, we had to deviate certain things, but again, we were really safe. The, um, the local authorities had made sure that there was enough security around uh, just all throughout the city. So the major monuments, the, the museums, all of those kinds of things, it feels very safe. And even in just recent years, uh, those of you who have been traveling to Europe lately, if you go to Florence in the last year, you know, pre-COVID, of course, but in the last year, if you went to Florence and you were walking by the Duomo, you would see armed soldiers there, really, like toting, toting their machinery, their, their weapons, making sure that nothing was going to happen. And it might seem like, oh, that's really nerve wracking. And I don't want to be around that. What's going to happen? What's going to nothing's going to happen because there are there is a presence there. In fact, it's probably the safest place that you could be at that point. Um, so to to weigh the situation and think about the actual risk versus what somebody who isn't there might be telling you. So meaning what you might hear in the media that is a little bit not I, I wouldn't necessarily say slanted, but they're trying to give you information in 30 seconds because they have mm. to get to the next story. And so all you hear is this happened, this happened, this happened without context, without the broader picture of what's happening. And so if you can talk to the, the locals that are there, talk to your hotelier, talk to the people in the restaurant, talk to whomever and find out what's really happening on the ground, um, whether you're there or you're going to go there, I think just kind of will allay some of your fears. And, and that's a lot of what it is, right? It's, it's good to be smart, it's good to be prudent, it's good to be vigilant, but you don't need to be fearful of something happening, right? You know, right around the corner. You, yeah, could walk off, you, you could walk in your own street and get hit by a bus. You don't know when that's gonna happen. You're gonna walk around afraid, you know? It, who knows? Most of these places, they're only on the news if that, whatever, that bad thing happens or whatever. It wasn't like every day you got the, I got the updates from Azerbaijan saying, oh, everything is normal, everything's normal. It's only, you just see it on the news when it's like not normal or something right. like that. And, and, and I would say that, that what, what you said about talking to locals, even before you go, if you know some locals there, that's, that's a, a place like Turkey where, you know, you hear, you know, you, you, you hear not just media, but other whispers of like, okay, this southeastern Turkey part has got issues. And I talked to someone who who was working there doing research for um, for a university, and he was like, yet yeah, this city, like that's the place I won't go to. So if I get someone who knows the place and says, I won't go to that city, but these other places, they're in the same region, so they get painted with the same brush, but they're not really that they're not really an issue because. You know he's there and so that means a lot more than just like hey this whole chunk of this country is like no yeah. go. i right. have kind of a real quick funny story because i haven't been to really dangerous countries but within italy um there's this fear of napoli and i'm up in the north and you know there's a whole north south thing in italy and my husband he's from the north in piedmont and he would not go to Napoli. And he said, I will not take you to Napoli unless we are with a local. And we will not drive with our car with a, we live in the province of Cunha. So on our license plate, we cannot leave our car in, in Napoli because they will know. Um, so just kind of a funny play on that, that yeah, I mean, I think talking to the local people, we finally went down. We had a local guy show us all his safe spots, his favorite spots, and we also did feel comfortable. So. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree with that. Colin, you have any uh, experiences traveling in these types of places other than um, Naples? <laughs> I've not been to Naples actually, um, but no, when I, so I was in Thailand and I think it was 2013 and there was a bit of political instability and to be completely honest, I didn't really know what was, what was happening. I think it, I think it was protests against the government or I don't think at that time it was yet against like the royal family, but I was there with a couple of friends and we knew it, we knew it was happening and 
we were kind of told by like the place we were staying, don't go near that certain area. But I was kind of laughing when Trish said, you know, if you hear there's a riot going on, don't go there. And <laughs> we were kind of young, naive backpackers and we thought, let's just go along and have a look. <laughs> so we went along and it's, and it's nothing like what obviously you see on TV. So exactly like you're saying, Trish, it's, they show on TV the flashpoints and the, if there's, a, if there's 100 protesters and one of them smashes something, that's the image that goes on the newspapers and in the news. But we just saw peaceful protesters and people were getting pictures with us and we wanted us to join them, but we, we didn't stay for too long. But um, maybe that's not the right thing to do. But, um, <laughs> but I think certainly yeah, it's, it's blown up by the media, what you see um, on the news. And another time that I was, I suppose, it wasn't, wasn't really political instability, but traveling and a politics situation was during the Scottish independence referendum. Um, so that was a, a peaceful um, political sort of debate. But it was nice for, I think, the tour members I was with during that time to be there during such a big moment of history. So it can be, it can be fun also to travel in countries when there's big things happening or big things maybe going to happen. Um, and so it's kind of fun to be a part of it when it's, when it's part of history. That's a really smart point, point Colin. And that reminded me, um, you know, in, in a lot of places, I, I don't know how it is in Scotland, but I know that in France and in Italy, if there's a demonstration going on, everybody knows well in advance. I mean, it's very well organized because the, you know, this syndicate or this union is going to do this march and they want people to rally together and they want to make sure also that things are not impeded too much, right? So public transportation is made well aware. The city is made well aware. There, there are marked routes where people can actually do their marches or their protests. And when I was in Paris, I, I do remember a, a major demonstration going on and it was, it turned out to be that it was for like a pay raise, right? And it was a pay raise for the, the engineers of whatever this one company. But what, what was really neat is that everybody turned out, right? College students turned out, professors turned out, uh, people from different factories were turning out because they knew that if this group was not getting their rights, what they were legally due, then that could happen to anybody else. So they marched all in solidarity. And if I had stayed in my hotel and not witnessed that happen, I actually went down to part of the route where the demonstration was happening. I mean, I learned so much just by listening to them, reading their signs, asking this person this, asking this person that. And so something that I could have been afraid of because all I saw on the news was demonstration happening, you know, these streets are cleared, whatever. Um, I would have missed out and I got a cultural and a political and a socioeconomic insight into a country that I didn't have before, which was super cool. Uh, one thing on the, uh, the uh, whatever, the place you were at Trish with the guards and whatever, because I'm not, I mean, whatever, I think in the US you're, you got policemen has, have guns and things like that. But like I was in Russia at a bank and there's a guy, young kid with an AK-47. Mm -hmm. It was actually the day after September 11th when I realized I, I better take out some um, some money before the the, do the dollar just completely crashes everywhere. And I went in there, and here's some you know kid who's like 20 years old, you know, with this like out outfit that's way bigger than him with the AK-47. At first, I'm just like, what is this? But I was like, you know what? This is like the way it's like for sure. Like no one else is freaking out. So like, and then I thought, well, you know what? I feel a little bit safer because you know it's everything just was like in that moment so weird. It's like, okay, well, you know, this is probably normal for them. And so sometimes like what's not normal for us can be normal for, for other people. And so you just have you have to kind of get get used to it, which I think if you travel to certain places many times, you probably are more, you might maybe have to explain it more to guests sometimes because you 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 don't notice certain things because they're more like, yeah, well, that's how it is in this country. And, and, and asking those further questions like, okay, it's like this and people feel comfortable with it, but why? I, mean, I was once in, um, where was I? I was in Nicaragua and I was doing, doing a small trip there. It was actually, actually on an educational trip and it was around Christmas time and the government would, was passing out basically piñatas to all of the families, right? Mm -hmm. So like every family, whether you were rich or poor, whatever, you had access to the piñata, you could have your own family celebrations. But what we learned also is that it was a way that the government was kind of appeasing the people, right? You give them this little thing that seems like, oh, okay, it's so much fun, it's great, we're thinking of you. And yet you walk through the streets there are no manhole covers on the streets. Like we can't afford to keep you safe. You might fall into a manhole, 
but we'll give you a piñata, right? So we're walking through this neighborhood and, and we're observing this party going on in their little courtyard. And, you know, we're waving hi, taking pictures and people are smiling at us. And, and a woman comes up and she says, with holding her baby and she's also with her mother, so three generations. Uh, and they say, you know, you probably shouldn't be here. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't mean to offend. Um, really apologize. She says, oh, no, it's not that. You'd be welcome, except that that guy's watching you, that guy's watching you, that guy's mm -hmm. watching you. They're eyeballing your purse. They're looking at your camera. And this is maybe not the best place to go. So she escorts us, the mom, the grandma, the baby. They escort us to the edge of the neighborhood and they take us to a, in front of a pharmacy where an armed guard is standing there with his AK-47 or whatever weapon that was. And then I'm looking at this going, wow, this is really fascinating. But that guard is not only protecting the pharmacy, right? Across the street, there's literally a McDonald's and there's an armed guard there. And it's just, like you said, Andrew, normal for people because there's concerns, right? Nobody's actually dying in the streets, but they just want to make sure that you're okay while we party and have our piñata and not fall into a manhole, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I would be more worried about, I think, the manhole than the <laughs> people trying to trying to uh, grab my purse or grab my camera. Um, so that that's a good little segue into next next topic, or really, it's more like a stories of using your travel smarts to get out of a sticky situation. And if you don't have three generations of Nicaraguan women to help you out uh, out of a tight spot like that, it's just some other kind of uh, ideas or things that have happened to you. Um, so this, this popped into my head when I was, I was just thinking of like the first time I went to this country, that country, the first time I went to Serbia was 10 years ago. And when I was getting off the train, I realized, oh, I didn't make any prior arrangements. I don't know how to get to my, my bed and breakfast. I don't have any local cash. I don't know anything because it wasn't really planned. It was like, hey, I'm just going to go here and check things out. And when I got out of the train station, you know how train stations are, you've got all these taxis. And I didn't walk through the one, the one exit, the main exit, because I didn't want to get harassed by these taxis, because I just figured, man, especially with no Serbian dinars, I'm for sure someone's going to rip me off, you know, and like, I probably deserve it too, because I showed up like totally unpre unprepared for this. And this was before I, I didn't have a smartphone or anything like this. So I couldn't just mm -hmm. like order up something. So I went out of like a side exit. And I just kind of surveyed all the taxis. I'm like, okay, I got to pick one taxi. They, I got the address. They got to, who's going to be the most trustworthy taxi? Who's like the least, like the best bet, the least likely to rip me off. And I'm probably going to have to ask them to stop by someplace so I can exchange some money. And I looked at all the taxi guys and there's one guy who was younger than everyone else. And he was the only one not smoking. And I was like, well, if nothing else, even if he rips me off, he's at least not smoking in the cab. And I figured like, that's a win in the Balkans. It's just not to have that. So I went up to him and I figured also, hey, he's younger. So, you know, you know, my Serbian lasted like three words and then I broke into English and he ended up helping me out, took me to a place that exchanged my money. I was still like halfway paranoid until I got to my hotel and looked at the exchange rate. And I figured, no, I didn't get ripped off. Um, ended up doing a couple of excursions with him. And at the end of my time in that city, he asked me, or the, the last the last day we were doing day trips together, he said, oh, where are you going next? I said, I'm taking a bus to Macedonia. And he's like, well, what time? I'll pick you up. He picked me up at the hotel, took me to the bus station, and waited for my bus to come, and waited for me to get on the bus and have my ticket checked and the bus to leave. And he didn't charge me anything. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, you already paid me enough for this. So it was wow. like, okay, like, like, you know, that was, that was great because I, the, the, the only thing I could think of was like, younger not smoking like that you know that should be good and just not having that be in that position of like having some random taxi driver grab you and then you're like okay i guess i'll go with this taxi so that was my like you know it's like this was like a like a great thing like if, if i if this could happen to me in every country where i could pull such a smart move off like this it would be fan fantastic but but now of course you know with with kind of me planning everything more and technology it's a little easier kind of to avoid yeah. this situation so mm -hmm. Wondering, um, um, Colin, maybe you have uh, some story you want to tell, mm -hmm. kind of given some, give some tips or some hints for people. Yeah. Um, well, it's yeah, kind of similar to what we've just been talking about as well, Andrew, with, with kind of dangerous countries or dangerous situations. So I always say, I have a saying that there's no such thing as a dangerous country or a dangerous place. It's a dangerous situation that you can put yourself in or try to avoid. 
Um, so my wife is from Mexico. She's from Mexico City. And very often when we tell people, oh, yeah, Claudia's from Mexico, they go, oh, is it dangerous? <laughs> and I always say, no, it's not. It's not dangerous. You can you can go to the dangerous parts or you can try and avoid them. Um, but a couple of years ago, we we're in we we're in downtown Mexico City and, of course, huge city, 20 million people, um, one of the biggest cities in the world. And so we're just being tourists. Uh, Claudia's lived in New Zealand now for 14 years. So we were back there just visiting family and friends and we're in the downtown, we're walking down the street and we're about to cross over at some traffic lights. And I just kind of noticed, so, there were, so like everybody crosses and then the traffic lights stop and it's like, don't cross and people keep crossing. And so we stopped being the tourists and I noticed another guy next to us kind of stopped just really abruptly. And I kind of just noticed it being a bit strange. And so then I looked at him and thought, okay, recognize him, or not recognize him, but registered him. And then we walked down the street a bit further um claudia sees a nice handbag shop so we went to the handbag shop and then i turn around and i notice he's there again and so i said to claudia i said right just just let's just try something here let's just walk down this way and then stop and turn around and he came behind us and then he noticed that we'd noticed him and so what i what i did just instinctively was just looked at him and just tried to make eye contact with him and then he kind of nervously sheepishly looked away and so i think it, that was I didn't, I didn't plan it or think about it beforehand, but that was just what instinctively I did and was a good way, I think, just to just to kind of be in a safe spot. So like a bit like Trish going to the pharmacy in Nicaragua, be in, go to somewhere that, that you'll feel a bit safer. So we'd just gone into the shop and then just to, to look him in the eye and to let him know that I've seen him. Um, and so then he backed away and we, we did keep our smarts about us as we went back out the shop. But I think it's just about kind of being being aware in those situations um i can give you another example as well um it's not it's not, not quite so um yeah quite so dangerous perhaps but it was actually in in florence uh, so i'd gone to florence to do an italian language course and I'd, so i'd been living in france and then i'd gone there at the end of my time just to study italian for a month um and i'd got to florence and i hadn't booked anywhere to sleep that night um, so I'd hopped on the bus. I think I'd flown into Pisa. Anna, Pisa and Florence about an hour and a bit apart. Is that right? That's in, in Florence. Uh, yeah, but, they're very close. Yeah. So so, I'd, so I think I'd flown into Pisa, got the bus through to Florence where I was going to be staying, and then couldn't find anywhere to stay there. So I went back to Pisa again, couldn't find anywhere to stay there, went back to Florence again. Um, and I'd more or less given up on trying to find somewhere to stay and I just sat down in the street so I had my big backpack with me just sat in the street in a, in a street where there were several backpackers um, youth hostels and then these three young American students came walking past and they said oh are you, are you okay and I said yeah I just can't find anywhere to stay and he said oh well come into where we're staying and you can I don't think you can actually sleep in the in the room but you can sleep in the hallway or something and so there was like this kind of cage that was like I think used for laundry for taking sheets and towels and so I slept the night in there and it was the most uncomfortable sleep I've ever had <laughs> but at least I was off the street and but those are good memories that you have yeah and yeah, you're really, like yeah. I am using booking.com next time <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah yeah but this was this was probably 2007 so I think it was before yeah. I had a smart for smartphones and things yeah and the lesson I learned from that was always book somewhere before you arrive in the place so even if it's a but day or two ahead I think that another point that I was going to bring up is that hostels are a really good um, source of information. If you find yourself lost and you are in a city, um, they're usually open 24 hours and you can go in there and find people who might speak your language and travel books and help. So um, that could be another solution. And like you were saying, I think just the main things it comes down to being confident. Like when you look to that guy in the eye, if you walk in mm. and if you, look weak you feel weak you're going to be a target so as much as you can to try to be confident and also trust your intuition so uh yeah yeah it was great you did it without a confrontation i mean you didn't even have to talk to the guy so that's a, yeah. that's like a really because that's like you start open your mouth and then you know that's you know so it's great you kind of you resolved it so quickly and easily and directly without yeah. without really doing well, much yeah and like i said you don't you don't put yourself in dangerous situations so we, we didn't really go out to any of the sort of dodgy parts of the city at night but i did do that when i was in brazil uh but when i did i was just very careful that i didn't take any valuables i speak portuguese as well so that sometimes i think surprised people when they started speaking to me and then suddenly oh he speaks portuguese and so 
knowing knowing the language can get you out of some troubles as well. Oh, de definitely. Hmm. Rish or Anna, you have a have a story to share. Um, I mean, I just I remember my one of my when I just first came to Italy and I didn't have any place to stay either and I knew no Italian and I took this tr overnight train all the way to uh, Pescara, which was a pretty scary experience in itself. But when you're young, I think you're just naive and you don't even realize you are in dangerous situations. And I remember this gypsy guy who followed me and I didn't even know, you know, the difference between Italian and I just had no clue. And he followed me and we actually had an espresso together in the morning. And I remember feeling, okay, he was talking and talking and, um, and then he asked me basically to pay for his coffee. And I remember being shocked by that, like, oh my God, like, who is this guy? Wait, why does he want my money? Why does it, you know? And then I kind of freaked out um, after that. And I just, it was probably like 5.30 AM in the train station. And I remember just finding somebody that looked reliable to me, whether it was an older, well-dressed uh, woman or, you know, a family or something and just like kind of plopped myself you know, right in between two people that looked pretty safe and normal who could protect me. And then he just ended up meandering away. But um, so yeah, just little little stories like that, just trusting the intuition, but and yeah, I think it, who you in, think you intuition and just like always finding like who is the safest face in the room or in the train station or 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 whatever. So that's exactly. I think that that plays a, a big key. Trish? I don't know. Yeah, I have um, maybe not so much about my travel instinct because sometimes that leads me awry just because <laughs> I'm <laughs> just freaking but out. You can or tell us and then everyone would do the opposite of what you do. So <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, but what I do rely on is I just I'm really embracing technology and allowing it to be my useful resource whenever I'm someplace. So um, I, I think I kind of always gravitate towards Italy when I Think about this because um, on the trains, you know, trains in Italy I have found can can very much run on time, but more often than not, I am waiting around for an hour for the train to actually show up, or I've just missed it, or something like that has happened. Um, but it's been nice to be able to use apps like the Trenitalia app to be able to find a new uh, train schedule and get on the next train, or if something happens, if there's a transportation strike. Um, one, of our, one of our viewers commented about uh, transportation, and transportation strikes in Italy, how that can just like make you just wanna throw your hands up, you know, because it just throws a wrench into all the machinery that you're doing for your travels. But when you have apps like that and you can be mobile and you can check right away and rebook something or do this, pay for it on your phone, it makes you so much more nimble and you can just not let it stop you in your tracks to continue with the metaphors of the train. <laughs> well, I, I might say for the, for the person commenting about the train strikes or, or transportation strikes, I'm not sure, but I think I think another reason to go with Flixbus because I don't think they would have that issue because I mean they might have Italians working for them, but I don't think they're in that union. So just a shout out for those for for those like I use Flixbus all the time now in Europe, and I do love trains, but damn, Flixbus can can be really really comfortable and really reliable and and price wise really good. So because so I've had yeah, I've had guests show up late on. <laughs> To, to, to tours or had to come in extra early from the, wherever they were at because of the um, scheduled uh, Italian mm. uh, transportation strikes and things like that. So um, it's definitely good to get yourself on those, those, out, those outlets. Where I live in Slovenia, it's never something I think about and I'm guessing, I don't know, I have no idea about New Zealand to be honest, but uh, I don't know if, is like, if, that's a, if that's an issue there, but there's certain countries you really have to, probably France and Italy would be the yeah. two main ones, or Germany. Public, public transport generally in Italy is, uh, sorry, in, in New Zealand is, is not great. Uh, people are very, very car, car dependent. So often mm. I hear of people, people coming here as backpackers or travelers, and they really struggle to, to get where they want to go with, with public transport. So I think it's not it's not through any fault of strikes or different things, but I think just because New Zealand has a lot of very rural places that it's really hard to have a good system that connects up everywhere. Um, so yeah, so I think I think that's something that, that could be improved here. Maybe we need to get what was it? Is it Flex? Did you say Flex bus? Flex, Flex bus. Yes. Next Flex. time you're 
in in Europe, you you could for mm-hmm. sure take them somewhere because they're they're running they're running everywhere now. So that's and, a, and they've bought out a lot of other companies yeah. as well. Um, some companies in Spain and in Italy, just you know, smaller bus companies that they had the they had the machinery right. They had the buses. Um, but they just weren't managing the routes very well. And so Flixbus has taken some of, taken over some of those. And it's been really mm-hmm. great because it opens up all even more places where you can go. Fantastic. Yeah, and you don't have to, if you go from one country to a country, three other countries away, you don't have to figure out, is it is it this country's bus that I'm going to take? Or is it the, uh, the country I'm arriving in's bus company and figure out what those schedules are or go to like Euro lines or whatever that used to be. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's, uh, I, I can't, re- I can't recommend it enough. So one of the things that I could, that I, that I can't, that I'm, that I can't really recommend so much or that I don't like is this, and someone, uh, I think we brought it up uh, in a meeting not too long ago, was, was eating at eating alone at restaurants. And I think the older I get, the less I like doing this. Now I kind of put it on my like least favorite things I like doing when I, when I travel. So um, of course, normally if I'm traveling with a group, I have a lot of meals with my group and I cherish that. Um, other than I just feel, you know, like, oh, great, I'm the only one sitting like I got my phone to look at or I could read my travel book at the at the mm-hmm. table. Um, the other thing, too, is when you go to a new country, especially when you go to a new country or some country like Georgia, where you want to try all these dishes, you're either like going to waste a lot of money or waste a lot of food or you're only going to like, OK, I only got to try like like one one of each of the appetizers and the main and the desserts or whatever. So just just for the fact of of wanting to try a lot in a new kind of cuisine culture, you really need some co-conspirators to kind of help you out so you can kind of, you know, like share dishes or do mezes or 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 whatever. So I'm not I'm not sure because I've heard that some people like don't mind this or maybe they like this or maybe they have some ideas of how to like um you know uh you know, remedy the situation. Uh, what, what do you say, Anna? I mean, I, I don't know who really loves eating alone. Um, it used to be a huge problem for me. I mean, I don't even like eating in restaurants where there are no other people inside. I mean, even with my husband or friends and there's nobody else inside and there's dead silence. I hate that. I always look for the, the crowded restaurants with some buzz going on. But in my, in my case, it's gotten easier the older that I've gotten, because I think for me, it was a more of a confidence issue. So, you know, when I was young and now we have smartphones, of course, like you were saying, so you really don't know what to do. You just look at your phone and catch up on, you know, for me, if I'm touring around, I'm, I always ask them, well, if you don't mind, maybe I'll, (laughs) maybe I'll eat with you, but I eat so much every day, all the time. It's actually a nice excuse for me, the op- opposite of what you were saying, to just eat less <laughs> and eat a salad or something instead of pasta, That's pasta. True. Um, no, but I think, yeah, the older that I've got, the more you know, curious, I, I'm just happy to observe what's going around. So maybe choose a restaurant where you can sit outside or um, there's something more interesting. You know, in the States, I think, we're used to kind of eating at a bar if you're alone or having big screen TVs with sports on them or something, which makes it a little easier when you're alone. Mm. Um, but in Europe, you know, you don't get that in a lot of places. So it's just a lot of me peaceful reflecting time, which um, I'm getting to be okay with now. So, <laughs> um, and then you read and, and catch up on what you need to. So. I don't I don't mind eating alone I think um, I think probably to be honest it's something I would do more when I'm not in my home city um, oh, I, think, yeah, of I, think, course. I think you definitely probably feel more conscious about it being in the place you live in um, but whereas when you're in a foreign place you're you stand out anyway and you're well it depends where you are but you're you're kind of in the whole new surroundings and I think yeah I quite enjoy it um, but when I was in Paris I was like 18 years old and backpacking and I went to a restaurant on my own, of course. Um, and I just kind of scanned down the menu. I saw something that said steak and it was a decent price. I said, yeah, I'll have that. So the waiter brought it and then it was steak tartare. So for anyone mm-hmm. not familiar, that's raw. <laughs> I think it's minced, raw minced, minced meat. And, yep. and I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know steak tartare before that. So I started eating it and then I was kind of uh, struggling with it. And the waiter recognized that though and he came over and he actually said, do you want me to ask the kitchen if they'll cook it? So, so, so those stereotypes. So you didn't like it? 
no I no I can, no because sometimes like it, no. that happens when you're like just bring me, you know I've done that whatever just bring me you know yeah. a sample and then it was like oh my god I don't know I don't know what I'm eating but it tastes so good maybe yeah. sometimes it's better not to know what you're eating but yeah but but it was really kind of the waiter just to say do you want do you want them to cook it and I said yeah okay so they cooked it <laughs> and so I had cooked awesome. the tartare and it was great yeah um so I actually laughed so I think it helps when you can speak the language wherever you're eating alone because you can always chat it up with your with the waiter or you know the people next to you if you're if you have that outgoing kind of personality but I, it is really hard when you can't understand anything on the menu mm. or yeah and it can be a nice way as well just to to meet people and have a little bit of small talk and conversation like with with the wait staff because they'll realize that obviously you're on your own and so they'll be a bit more they attentive pity I think. You. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and then I actually last year I think it was last year um when I was back in Scotland and I was in Glasgow my home city and I was near the end of my time there like just had about three days before coming back to New Zealand and I'd happened to be over in the west end of Glasgow and it was kind of late afternoon I hadn't had lunch and then I was walking past a really good restaurant that I'd never been to it's called Kilbruch if anyone wants to check it out um, so I was walking past and I thought, I've never tried this. Go on, I, I think I deserve it. And so I went in and just had, asked for a table for one, and I had the degustation menu, so just the whole thing, just a long, <laughs> long lunch. Uh, so just the starters, a mousse bouche and everything, and wine pairings with it, and it was great. And I just, again, chatted to the waiters, and uh, even this couple next to me at a table next to me, they started chatting to me, obviously, because they noticed I was alone, but maybe things like that happen more in places like Glasgow, where everyone talks to each other, so... And drinking yeah. a lot. <laughs> yes, as well. Yeah, that could definitely change the equation somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Irish pubs, Scottish pubs, or if you go to Germany, obviously, if you go to any beer garden, it is communal seating together, right? So you can be alone and suddenly you have 500 friends. Yeah. And everybody's just, it doesn't matter what language you speak because you speak beer and that's all good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that, that is true. Yeah, I, I right before... Um, when I was doing a little research on this, I saw a couple apps because I vaguely remember someone telling me when I mentioned this a few years ago, oh, there's some apps you can get. So if you don't want to dine alone or whatever, and I'm not sure if anyone's used any of them, but most of the ones I looked at were like, I don't think they're around anymore. So I'm not sure if that whole idea took off. But when I first traveled to Europe, it seemed like there was a few more restaurants that would would seat you with other people that you know like hey we've got a four person table mm. and there's only two and put you there and I always enjoyed that because that's a great way to meet people that you're just you know you're you're not going to meet especially like maybe if you're at a bar it's one thing but if you're at a restaurant it's great and I remember one place in Estonia I think I spent like a couple hours like afterwards just walking around with these I think they were they were both sisters from like the neighboring country and they hadn't been there so I was like oh I've been here for five days I'll give you like a free tour of, of what I vote so that was so much better than you know it was like well here's me and my lonely planet book again <laughs> <laughs> but some uh, of the delight of eating on your own is just to is sometimes not to have the conversation right to just sit there yeah. and sit in silence and sit and observe and I think of when I would go to Paris and sit on the terraces and delightfully sit at a table by myself for hours eating or sipping a coffee or having a dessert and just watching the mm -hmm. world go by and yeah. it was some of my best times that I've spent there because it was just about being in that particular moment or if you go to Vietnam and you you know everybody just eats out on the streets and they have these tiny tiny chairs that they look like they're for three-year-olds but everybody sits in them and they're all just congregating and sitting out there and you're just part of that scene and so even if you are by yourself you're never alone you know you're, you're part of it and I, I I find enjoyment in that not not always I don't want all that to always be the experience um, because I do love the conversation I love the whole um, just being able to engage with somebody and and there is something about the meal being enhanced because it is shared with somebody right that it, it elevates it to a different level and so I think that there's a way to find balance in that and to allow yourself that moment to be away from everything else or away from from whatever it is that you're doing in that particular travel um, moment you know get don't don't focus on you know what are your next plans what is this just be in that individual solo moment and then balance that out with discussing that with somebody with your travel partner with your loved one with whomever and and enhancing your 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 dining experience and also your travel so the the 
next topic we're going to we're going to discuss is something that's popped up I, I saw three different articles in the last 24 hours um if you know and this is you know this for me is like actually like a really big, i think for all of us in the travel business and for people who want to travel a really big deal is if rapid testing can come to is going to come to airports but kind of more than that uh is oh can we have some kind of globally agreed standards um so travel industry, which includes like the airlines and the, it's called IATA, International Air Transportation Associations, they want, they want governments to kind of develop and, harmon and get like some kind of harmonious approach. So rather than just saying, okay, you can, if you're American or if you're from country X, Y, and Z, you can't come here. Or if you do, you have to do 14 day quarantine. Uh, we'll replace those with rapid and accurate testing. Some of the articles mentioned a few different tests that would be somewhere between five, one, five minutes up to maybe 40 minutes. And they, they actually mentioned prices like seven to 20, Dollars, which is a lot less than like if I had to take COVID, pay for COVID test here in Slovenia, and I think it's the same thing in the states and in other places. Um, I've been a lot of people have been asking me uh, for the last couple months, especially people who want to go on a tour next year or just want to travel or say, "Oh, you're you know you you're you're you got your ear to the ground. What's going on?" And I'm always saying, "Okay, one, I don't know anything more than than everyone else does." But I know what needs to happen, at least in my opinion. Um, and what we what we really need is we need medicine, technology, and business to come up with solutions. Um, because I've seen how politics have played out in Europe, and it's been absolutely garbage. Um, because at the end of the day, what do you you want to get on a flight and say, oh, everyone on this flight, because whatever they all have, sweet. Swedish or French or whatever EU passports, that's okay. I'm sure I'll be okay, or uh, regardless of what their health situation is. Or would you rather be on a flight that's like, okay, anyone who boarded this flight in the last, you know, it's on this flight right now, they all had to have a negative test to get on this flight. I'd rather be with that because you, like, I'm going to have more confidence that that's a, a more truthful way of doing it. And it does get rid of politics and it does have all the airports with the room they have, the technology, the security, everything else, they're the one kind of center where you can go to rather than just say, okay, everyone go to a hospital and do this and that. You can have boarding procedures where it's like the only way you board the plane is if you take these these turnaround tests. So I want to get would like to get other people's thoughts on this. I'm I'm definitely a you know, hey, look, we, we, if you're just going to wait around for vaccine and hey, look, people can wait around for a vaccine and not travel until there's one and then maybe they won't travel until they've seen the vaccine work for X amount of time or whatever. But there's a lot of us is like, hey, I don't, I'm, I'm not interested in, in staying in my basement and just doing nothing until this like kind of perfect scenario uh, happens. I'm like, okay, look, you know, virus is out there and I don't think it can just be wiped out, but let's get some steps to, to get some progress going because we haven't had much progress in the last four or five months. Hmm. Anyone uh, want to weigh in on this? Yeah, well, I think, I think certainly there, there's most likely going to be some kind of travel before a vaccine because, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but from what I hear, the vaccine is still a year or more away, perhaps. Some, I've heard people say the end of this year, but like, it's probably wishful thinking. I hope I'm proved wrong. But... And like you say, Andrew, it will take time for the vaccine to, to sort of bed in and people to get used to it and to trust it. So, yeah, I think definitely some sort of travel has to, has to start up again before a vaccine. Um, the, the CEO of, of Air New Zealand, he, he gave an uh, interview recently with the Sydney Herald, I think it was. And he was saying that, yeah, basically we need to, we need to start traveling without a vaccine. Um, so what, what's been discussed here in New Zealand has been like a some sort of bubble between New Zealand and Australia. It was discussed way back in April, uh, thinking about it maybe starting by September, but then second waves have put paid to that. So I think it will be small incremental blocks of countries maybe more so. So I know that in Europe, obviously it's, there's different, different situations between different countries and there's obviously people crossing land borders there. But for New Zealand, because we're so kind of isolated in a way, I mean, we're four hours flight from Auckland to Sydney. Uh, so it's not that close. I think really it's going to be in this part of the world anyway, in these bubbles. So I think rapid testing, yeah, would make a difference. And then again, depends on the science of how accurate and how 
quick that can that can uh, bring the results. And then um, again, another caveat: that I'm not a scientist, but the whole um, the whole incubation period. I don't know if it's the same in other places, but here, when people come into quarantine, so they arrive back in New Zealand, they do 14 days quarantine. They have a test on day three and then day 14. So some people can show negative in day three and then positive in day 14. So I don't know how how accurate those rapid tests would be if if people are not um, well showing symptoms or not the virus has not been incubated yet. So I guess that would be a big question for me is how does that work? Yeah, I mean certainly we we don't have uh, all the answers. I think I think mm. because of because of the fact that with airports you can really say hey like hey you can't get on this plane and you know you've got to pass this test or let's say there's a vaccine you need the certificate that you've been vaccinated or whatever. In some ways I think it could be easier actually to get to get air travel going before for border crossing then like you're right in Europe you know you've got car you've just got cars trains whatever so in some ways air, the airport seems like a kind of easier solution because like you have to all go through this one point where whereas in cars you can just you know cross uh cross borders easily more easily and if you're going to check people then you've got to reinstate you've got we've got to get rid of Schengen and then reinstate all these people and have these medical tests on borders and things like that so I don't know how it could work so easily outside of the airports but I think it's I think it's worth worth the shot and what what I keep thinking is like hey you know whether or not we wanted to bail out the airlines pretty much everyone bailed out their airlines but mm -hmm. I mean it's like if we bailed out our airlines to the tune of billions of dollars but then nothing's really happened since it's like they're going to get a second bailout or they're all just mm -hmm. going to go defunct or I mean that's a that's like a huge thing and I don't want people just this I mean I understand where people could say oh it can't everything can't be about money but everything can't be not about money I would say hmm. mm -hmm. Trish or Anna you've got any, I, any, well, any, any thoughts I'd, I'd be curious to see how that could actually get implemented and in a, in a in a speedy way and I wouldn't want it to be too speedy I would I really would want to have this really well fleshed out and what you might have in Germany, like Germany could be ready to do that sooner than um, Italy or France or whatever. But think of all of the different airports that you would have to have that, right? And all of the different people that would be coming in and not only the passengers, but also the flight attendants, the, um, the, the pilots, all of that staff, and maybe even people that you're interacting with at the, the gate or whatever, because you're gonna have to check as people are coming through, it's it's a it's a huge space where people can be intermingling with one another, even if they social distance. Um, I don't know. I'm just uh, maybe I'm I'm too much of a skeptic. I'm hopeful, and I wish that there would be something that could happen very fast. But I'd rather have something that is sure and safe and um, and has a, a better predictability of whether or not somebody actually has that. You could stop somebody who is you know, showing signs of fever or whatever, or is having some kind of symptoms, or if you pay test for it, you can prevent them from getting on board. But as Colin was saying, what if you are asymptomatic? You could still be a carrier and all of those people around you that are, that are in that flight, um, you know, we're, we're at each other's mercy. And I, I don't know, I just, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any like other, scientific fact behind that. I too am not a scientist. I just know my own feelings. And I, I think about how does that affect my own family with my, my dad's health, um, with my, you know, my, my best friends and then their kids, all of those kinds of things. I want to travel as much as anybody. I mean, I'm just, I, I got to get out, like I, I get me to Switzerland, let's go. But um, I don't know. I just gotta. I got. I gotta weigh that safety factor, and I don't. I don't need. I don't need to be rushed into doing that just because of my inner desire to get somewhere else. But it's all going to be choice anyway, and you're going to pay for it. I mean, that's the thing. It's. It's like so many other things. It's like there's a lot of things that I'm not. That I don't want to do, and I will choose not to do them. And I think that this could work because initially, it's not like everyone's going to be. The hordes of people are going to be rushing back to the airports and have these crowds. 
But what's happened, and this is almost 90, 100% politics, is when the UK says, hey, you know what, we switched our minds. So in, in 36 hours, if you're in France or Spain, you got to be back here or you're quarantined for two weeks, like, or you're going to like, go, to, go to bed with no dinner. And so what happens? Everyone floods these airports and train stations. And that's when, and you have no control over that. And there's no testing there. And, and you're, if anything, you're probably made the situation even worse. So the, the, my thing is, because I've just seen so many examples of all these countries just F things up so badly or not make, not make any decisions based on New Zealand. People from New Zealand could have come to all the EU countries and so many of them like no we won't take we won't take them but we'll take our mm -hmm. other buddies over here because like our president and their president are buds and their their country's doing worse in covid but we'll have them but like new zealand and japan which are doing much better we won't have them it's like man you, you just i i get to the point where it's like if you if you're you're either going to let people in based on on medical reasons or or you're not going to let people in because the whole country thing is just it all it all goes into politics so so quickly mm. and that's what I'm that's my biggest frust frustration. I mean, um, it's it's to me it's a worse situation now than when we were under lockdown because you figured well someone's going to have a plan and I'm at the point where I just can't imagine governments any government really having some great plan other than maybe they could have a plan for their own country but otherwise some kind of global thing. I think it's I think. Like most things, things are led now by business or innovations or technology. So I'm curious to see what this will happen, what where this will go. One other th one other article that just came in about an hour ago was that United Airlines is going to try this just on this like San Francisco to Hawaii flights, and they're going to do like mail. You can either do it th there at the airport or do some kind of mail-in test, and I'm sure there's a window on that. So because I think Hawaii is going to open up, and they want to. This is going to be some, you know, kind of test to see how how this will work if they can open up at least to like the San Francisco market. So I think it's going to happen like probably like Colin said in these smaller bubbles or smaller chunks, and then kind of see how it goes from there. It's definitely a step in the right direction, I think, because um, we don't know how long this is going to last. So. Uh... Yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, like you said, there is a lot of politics involved. I mean. I actually did have um, two tours last week and they were both from the UK. And you're hearing right now, oh, they're on the verge you know, of another lockdown. And, and then you're thinking, but this country, they have no quarantine here. They don't have to do anything because of business reasons. So you know, how much sense does that make? So like, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying, Andrew, but I understand you too, Trish, that you know, it has to be something that's reliable. Um, and then how frequently do the visitors have to take this test? And they tried something like that um, in Italy because after such a hardcore lockdown here in Italy, you know, everybody was dying to go on vacation. And, you know, August is, is a must in Italy. You have to take your Ferragosto. But um, they were testing people before they got on the ferries to go to Sardinia, to the island because I, uh, Sardinia at that time had like zero cases and they didn't want any of us coming there. Um, but I don't really know if they ended up testing everybody, but there were outbreaks in Sardinia eventually. And maybe that's because they weren't, you know, checking the airport, checking people at the airports or there were other ways that people were coming in. So, or, or also just people like whatever, not listening to the rules or not playing by the rules that you're supposed to. Cause I've seen it here in Slovenia and Croatia that, I mean, where the press has said, Hey, you know, there's this kind of false narrative of like, Oh, it's oh, how these, most of, most of these cases must've been imported, but now, and I don't know how they do it, but they can do it. And this like hardly anything's imported. So it's more of less, Hey, you know, like these people broke rules or didn't do this or didn't do social distancing or, you know, someone got around the curfew at a club and rented a boat on the water. So therefore it's not, you know, and, you know, and then there's 30 people test positive who went on that party boat. So, uh, cause I know there's some people who be like, okay, yeah, if you have if you let more people in, you're going to get more, but it's like, I think it's really the, you know, it's the behavior of people. And so if, if, a bunch of idiots want to break all these rules and party together and, and do whatever. If they don't, if they're not allowed to go to country X, they'll be doing that in this country. So in some mm -hmm. ways, I was kind of glad this summer where it's like, okay, Slovenians, you go down to Croatia like normal. And if you're going to, you know, not heed the warnings and all that stuff, that's fine. Cause I could walk around my city where we have, you know, two active cases. And we've had, I think 
40 in the entire year here because it's like it's safer here because people aren't, aren't aren't doing it here but i think it's still a lot of behavior and 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 other issues and not just hey people traveled and that that's the reason why you know we've had another outbreak but i mean hey this is a this is a huge topic and we don't know all the you know what the how the how these tests will be how accurate they will be but i think it's it's this is like the first time it seems like since we've been doing guide roundtable that that I've read these articles where it's like, okay, someone's actually talking about trying to get some standards and some way to get things going. So I'll take that as a positive, you know, as a, as some baby steps for now, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let's go light at our at our very uh, end here with a around the table. Since it is autumn, we uh, we I figure out I'll, I'll ask everyone. I'll start with you, Colin, first is what's the what's the one thing for you that says autumn or the one place you go or the one thing you do or the something that you start eating or drinking or whatever that's like and i know and i'll just like as a pop guy, yes <laughs> yeah. i know it's not autumn in in new zealand so i'll let yeah. i'll give you a two you can either tell me about autumn or tell me uh, since it's spring now you can tell me what's what's how do you know it's spring when in new zealand yeah well, i was just about to totally throw a spanner in your question there andrew because yeah <laughs> think we're getting into springtime here in new zealand and the thing that for me, well, here is I've, I've lived now in New Zealand for five years and it still all feels upside down. Um, so basically we're getting into spring is. now. Yeah, yeah. So, so we get into spring and then we start talking about Halloween and, um, and we've imported um, traditions like Guy Fawkes. Uh, so in the UK, we have Guy Fawkes night and we have fireworks and bonfires. It's not as big here as it is in the UK, but for me, that feels really strange in spring <laughs> to be doing fireworks and bonfires and then of course we have Christmas and summer and then we have Easter and autumn and so at Easter time you've got all the marketing and imagery of little chicks and Easter bunnies and things and all springtime images and daffodils and it just it just doesn't feel right so <laughs> so, what it, so so for me autumn is yeah is upside down <laughs> you don't even know what that is anymore <laughs> yeah, yeah doesn't exist Anna, you have a, you have something about wine or vineyards or something? Yes, of course. I mean, it? it's like the natural transition of rosé and white and sparkling wines to, okay, we're ready to open the good stuff, the Barolos, the red wines, the important wines. So, and also here um, in our area, uh, it's famous for chestnuts. So once you see just all the parks and all the streets full of chestnuts, um, you know that it's fall. Yeah, you cannot beat that smell. That is just like I never get I'll never get tired of the chestnut, roasted chestnut <laughs> smell. <laughs> Trish, what about you? What's what's your what's your it must be autumn? Okay, well, since I am now back in my hometown of San Diego, it's uh it's kind of strange because we still have all of our our hot weather going on and typical for autumn for us is to have the Santa Ana winds, which are the east to west blowing winds, which brings in a ton of heat. Um and I mean, I, not to make light of it, but it, it's kind of true. I know that it's autumn when it's fire season, right? Mm -hmm. So that we, we've got all of that going all over California, all up and down the West Coast. But when I was living in Seattle, oh, autumn was just my favorite time of year to see all of the, the leaves changing colors into these ruby reds and these rich orange colors and these saturated yellows it was stunning and it was something that I hadn't known having lived in in California basically the majority of my life and then moving up to Seattle uh, 10 years ago to experience that for the first time and then the following years it was just magical and that's the thing that I always look forward to and yeah getting wrapped up in your sweaters and wearing your scarves and having, you know, a different jacket, different coat for every day of the week, you know, match the leaves, wow. whatever. That was, that was the thing. I loved don't, it. I don't move it. to like the equator or something. Cause you'll <laughs> never have any, any of that. Well, I grew up in San Diego too, and then moved to Seattle. And I remember people saying, why would you move? And I was like, well, we, we don't really have any seasons to be honest, you know? Uh, so, you know, I was going to say, I was going to say exactly the same thing Anna did. I was like, okay, if I have to have another fresh white, you know, it's like middle September, don't yeah, give me the fresh white. I want like, give me something age, give me some macerated something or give me red. 
but the one thing that so I won't I won't do that and chestnuts because both of those are, those okay. are excellent. Well, we're not I, far from each other, so that it, makes it, sense. exactly yes, good good taste buds think alike. Um, so I will go with um, I've got quite a few uh, good uh, friends in Slovenia that are photographers. So that I, I'm I kind of wait until like where's that post? Where's that awesome photo post they have of the of the color somewhere, you know, because mm. they're like, you know, they're the kind of people that will, you know, go on a hike for four or five hours just to get to that one viewpoint or whatever. And me, it's like, oh, I'm, I'll drive by, oh, I'm going to pull over here and take a couple shots from the, that roll down my window and then like move on. But like they do all the hard work to go to these beautiful places and get all the colors. It's like, so when I see those like starting to pop up on Facebook, because I live on the coast. So it's kind of like being in, in San Diego or California, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, you know, maybe a little cooler, but so autumn to me is seeing everyone's got their kind of fall color picks and, and things like that. And the that. fog, lots of, uh, where we live, there's the rolling hills of vineyards and then all the castles on the hills. And you start seeing the morning pictures where it looked like there are castles floating on the clouds. And mm. so that's really special in the fall. Nice. Well, everyone, thank you for, jo thank you for joining us, all, all the viewers out there. Uh, thank you. Thank you to Colin and Anna for coming on and being first timers and you're always welcome back an, an, another time. Um, and speaking of another time, uh, we will, we're doing this every two weeks now. So our next episode is gonna be 8th of October. So two Thursdays from now and everything is not completely set in stone but we'll do another expat round table. I will not be moderating it because I'm going on vacation or something like that, or just I don't know, doing, you know, still hanging out in my apartment, but not being <laughs> on the show. Uh, Sarah's going to take over for that. And we'll have uh, some fresh voices, some new voices from Europe talking about expat topics. So everyone stay tuned for that. And we'll have something up on the Guide Collective Facebook page, letting you know more details when available. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, That's guys. it. Thank That's you. it. Thank good you. Good evening or good morning. Oh, good morning. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>